Hey, welcome, folks. It's good to be with you today. Now, listen, this is a special edition of the 700 Club from all across America. You called and left your voice made questions. They're yours. Today, we're going to hear your voices on the air, and we'll answer your questions live. That's all coming up. But first in the news, tragedy in, in Ukraine. Missiles are raining down on civilians. Cities on fire. And millions are playing for their lives in Ukraine. The Russian army has resorted to scorched earth warfare after meeting fierce resistance from Iranian forces. The capital city of Kiev is now under strict curfew and bracing for the worst in the next few hours. Charlene Aaron reports on this brutal onslaught. As the Russians are stalled outside Ukraine's capital city, Kyiv, they're relentlessly bombarding the civilian population. Rockets, missiles, and bombs leaving significant damage. Residential neighborhoods, hospitals, and other civilians targeted. And Ukraine's leaders expect the onslaught to get worse. CBN's George Thomas is in Kyiv. The latest reporting from the Pentagon is that the Russians have launched over 900 uh, missiles uh, since the start of the war. One of those missiles uh, hitting this multi-story uh, apartment building uh, on the west side of Kyiv. You can still see the smoke billowing. This happened uh, yesterday. Uh, and all the surrounding buildings as well, uh, you can see their windows have been basically blown out, even to that building uh, apartment over there. What you are seeing today is that because the Russians have failed uh, over these many days to completely uh, encircle and capture uh, Kyiv, that they are instead going after civilian targets. Uh, the mayor of uh, Kyiv has uh, imposed a province-wide curfew. Nobody can go out of their uh, homes until Thursday at 7 a.m. Why? Because uh, the mayor fears that the next few hours are going to be probably the most dangerous hours uh, for this city. Ukrainian President Zelensky addressing Congress today in a virtual speech, thanking the U.S. for its help and asking for billions more in new support. With reports that Russian troops are low on morale over their lack of progress, Zelensky says Russia's demands in peace talks are sounding more realistic. But U.S. State Department officials urge caution. We have yet to find a Russian interlocutor that is either able or willing uh, to negotiate in good faith, and certainly not in the context of de-escalation. Meanwhile, three million have fled the war in Ukraine, creating the largest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. CBN's Operation Blessing is on the border, greeting refugees with gift bags full of snacks, hygiene items, and other supplies. And from a warehouse on the Polish side of the border, they're packing trucks full of crucial supplies and sending them into Ukraine. These goods will be a real blessing to the people of Ukraine who really need it right now because there's a shortage in the shops. We have teams ready in Ukraine to distribute these goods. So it's amazing to see how God is bringing these uh, strategic locations together and the people together to help make this happen. Meanwhile, President Biden is expected to announce $800 million in new military aid to Ukraine. He'll go to Brussels next week for the NATO summit on deterrence and defense efforts against Putin's war. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. I want to say about Operation Blessing, we've been operating all over Europe for quite some time, but we've got a major team going with Orphan's Promise and Operation Blessing in Ukraine. And uh, uh, if you want to help those poor people, you can do it through Operation Blessing. That's the number. Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, and uh, you can call in. Now, let me talk to you a little bit before we go into our questions. You know, the Polish people were going to make mega uh, jets available, but we said, oh, no, that'll be an escalation. Uh, and well, how about uh, uh, a no-fly zone? Well, that would be an escalation. Well, we, we've got to be careful because we don't have an interlocutor to deal with this problem, and it might be an, in, in, uh, an escalation. 
Let me tell you something, just real carefully. We have in the ocean one, just one of many Trident submarines that have enough nuclear power on board to eviscerate any of the cities in Russia. Putin knows it, we know it. So it, can you imagine playing poker and every time you call the bluff, the other guy threw in a winning hand. Well, that's what's happening now. We are so terrified of, quote, an escalation. We won't use the MiGs the Poles have got. We won't uh, have a no-fly zone. We won't send the necessary equipment to the Ukraine because we are afraid of an escalation. You heard what the man was saying. Well, we don't have a, quote, interlocutor. Baloney. We have the firepower to wipe out every Russian city, just one Trident submarine. And of course, we're not using it and they have no intention of using it. But why doesn't somebody in the administration call Putin's bluff? He's bluffing. And every time he says, well, if you do that, we're going to escalate. Oh, no, you're not, old buddy. We're going to do you if you try to do us and we'll make it worse. And you know it. Putin knows we were powerful. He doesn't have much of, a, of an army. He doesn't have much of an economy. It's a tiny economy, and he's playing a bluff. But unfortunately, we have a man in charge in Washington who doesn't like to stand up to bluffs. He folds his winning hand every single time. Yeah. That's my commentary on it. <laughs> and Wendy was saying. I think a lot of us agree with exactly what you said. We are so blessed to have Pat back in the studio with us. And we've got your voice qu uh, mail questions. We're starting with John, and he's from Springfield, Oregon. I have a friend that seems to have a prophetic heart, or at least says he does. How would he know for sure he can speak as an oracle of God in this present day? Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, if you have a gift, you exercise the gift, and the way you know that somebody's a pro prophet if what he says doesn't come to pass, you don't have to fear him. But at the same time, I mean, you know, uh, if he has a gift, let him exercise the gift. That's what the Bible says. And, uh, but that's how you know a prophet. I mean, if he speaks about the future and it doesn't come to pass, then y you need to deal with him, especially if somebody claims he's speaking in the name of the Lord and he isn't really, then he's a fake and you don't want that. Amen. All right, we've got this caller from Richmond, Virginia. Go ahead. I have been wondering about Job in the Bible. Was he a real person or was it a story that was used to teach us? And if he was a real person, why would God do all of those things to him since he was such a good man? Thanks for your answer. Uh, Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. And for all I w we know, he was a real man. But why did he go through that uh, agony? Because he was exhibit A. The devil came. Uh, apparently, in those days, he had access to the fa to the father, and he and he said, "You know, have you considered my servant Job?" And God was using Job as an example of somebody who was true to Him. And uh, Job said, "Though he slay me, yet will I trust him." And he never sinned. And God, when it was over with, gave him twice of what he had before. He went through a period of time, but it wasn't long. Uh, it was less than a year. He suffered for a while. And then when it was over with, God gave him double. But he is an example of those of us who know the God, and though we're under some kind of persecution, we will persevere and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And it's that declaration of faith that wins. And it's such an encouragement, Pat, because in the end, Pat, uh, Job gets back double, twice, double, double exactly. everything. Yeah, exactly, double. Yeah. And the, t the torment couldn't have lasted much over a year. I mean, he was suffering, but it was a short period of time. And, and the devil did his job, and, and, and Job, uh, the wonderful thing, in my flesh, I will see God, and I'm not going to give up my 
profession of victory in the Lord. That, that's, that's what Job teaches us, all right? Amen. All right, Mary from Philadelphia, PA. Here she is. In Daniel chapter 3, when the three Hebrew boys were thrown in a fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar's command, where was Daniel? Thank you. Have a blessed day. Well, I, I think Daniel, Daniel was writing about it. Uh, da, Daniel wasn't put in the fiery furnace. It was the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, Daniel was, uh, the, you know, the, the, the prime minister of the king. And... Uh, uh, he, he he lived to write about it, but he had quite a story to tell. Where was he? That the best way we know. <laughs> he was praying, probably. Here's Cheryl from Livermore, California, with this question for Pat. Pat, out of all the books that you've written, which one is your favorite, and how long did it take you to write it? Thank you. Uh, I think probably the favorite is I Walk with the Living God, and. It told a story of the beginning of my life with the Lord and the years that have followed. And uh, uh, I, I didn't write it. I used to write all these words. And all the books I've written recently have been dictated. And I dictated it and went over and over and over. And I think that has had more power to change people's lives. I'm getting it translated into... Uh, Chinese, I'm getting it translated into Farsi and to get it in other languages because I think it'll build people's faith. But it, it uh, you know, it, it, I, I wrote one book, uh, The End of the Age, I had it written almost in 30 days. I mean, I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. I'd wake up, I, I, I was uh, up in the mountains and I'd, I'd get up about midnight and I'd go and I'd write till three or four or five o'clock in the morning and then I'd, I'd, I'd write again. Uh, but uh, that that uh, I wrote the whole thing in about 30 days, but it, that, the other took a little bit longer. But I've written a, a, the last one isn't published yet. It's the one on on uh, the uh, uh, great man of God, uh, David, the shepherd king, and I, that, that's going to be. A powerhouse, in my opinion, a wonderful book. Right? The end of the age is uh, so mm -hmm. timely for right now, and it's the only novel that sh that you wrote, yeah. and it's so good you cannot put it down. And of course, um, I walk with a living God. That is also yeah. my favorite. Well, amen. Yeah, because, well, you know. there you go. <laughs> All right, so our next question, Teresa from Nutley, New Jersey. My question is: Does God allow us to see loved ones in heaven that have passed in our dreams and visions? And also, do deceased family members in heaven remember us, or are they allowed to see how loved ones are doing on earth? Thanks very much. Um, uh, you've asked several questions. I don't think loved ones can look down on earth and see what we're doing. I don't believe that we're surrounded by a great crowd, uh, crowd of witnesses, but I don't think the loved ones are looking. But at the same time, when we get to heaven, uh, we will definitely know all the people. We'll all recognize. We'll recognize little children uh, that we've had. We'll recognize all the people, and there'll be glorious reunions. But just keep in mind that once we're in heaven, we will not marry or give in marriage. We'll be like the angels. So they won't be, the, the, the families won't be rejoined like we uh, have on earth, but we'll recognize everybody without any question. Oh, I hope so, because <laughs> I just got married. <laughs> All right, Dawn from Fall River, Massachusetts. I want to know, Good Friday, can you eat me as a Christian, and are you supposed to follow the Lent? I love your show, and I give to it, and I absolutely adore you, Pat. Thank you. I've been watching for years. That was very sweet. Um, Look, uh, the, the uh, fish on Friday is a, is a Catholic thing. Uh, I think the Catholic Church wants to do that. Uh, I, I don't follow that thing. I eat meat on Friday if I have to. I, you know, wh whatever's good for me at the particular time. I may want, I may, I may want some cereal, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 to my knowledge, there's no problem. Now, some people that come Lent, they want to give up something to show of their devotion to the Lord. So they may give up eating meat. They may give up uh, sweets. They may give up some particular thing. But um, 
to my way of knowledge, the, the, the eating uh, fish on Friday is, is not something that was prescribed in the Christian church that I, I'm familiar with. It, it is in the Catholic tradition, but it's not in the overall church in the Bible. All right. Sarah from Albuquerque, New Mexico, with this question. I wanted to know why I feel so bad by disapproving of my stepdaughter being gay. We're supposed to love all, and I don't want to feel like that no more. Thank you. God bless. Uh, Sarah, you know, the Bible says that to lie with a woman as with a man is a sin, and to the unnatural desires that are being imposed on people in today's society is, is just wrong. And and the, the one day the people who are doing that are going to have to pay the price. I, I noticed the, in the news a woman, a teacher, was being reprimanded and actually fired from her job because she, she called one of the students Miss, and she's the woman said, I, I'm not Miss, I'm I'm, I'm something else, and then she started calling her by her last name because she couldn't come to it. Hmm. Uh, you know, you, I think it's wrong. So the fact that you feel uncomfortable about the situation, you should feel uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean you don't love them. Of course you love them. You want to love them and, and see them come to the Lord. So you're not rejecting them, but you don't approve. You know, you love the sinner, but you hate the sin. Amen. Amen. All right, Jimmy from Rock Hill, South Carolina, with this question for Pat. In the Bible, Jesus said that in heaven we will not marry. However, when we come back to earth, as it says in Revelations, will that change? Will we be able to marry or will we be with the, our loved ones that we married on earth before we were raptured out or passed away? Thank you. You know, when... The Lord comes back, we will be resurrected with, we'll have heavenly bodies, we'll be like Him. Of course, we'll see Him as He is. Uh, in heaven, they're spirits, but as the resurrection, we'll also have spiritual bodies. But those spiritual bodies are not going to reproduce uh, like on earth, and uh, you know, they neither marry nor are given a marriage. And, and I, I think that will follow through on the rapture and whatever happens. Amen. A lot of people wanting to know that today. <laughs> All right, Lynn, Lynn from Victory, Ohio. I love that name of that town. Go ahead. I have a question about healing. I'm praying for healing, and some of the small things get healed, but the big things are still there. How come the small things get healed, but bigger things don't? Thank you. Well, I, I think you have faith for the small things. You know, you can pray for a headache because, listen, if the headache doesn't go away, you can always take an aspirin or a Tylenol. So you say, I can believe God, take away the headache, but just in case I miss, here's some medicine for it. But you have cancer, and you know, then you've got to believe in a big way. So uh, it takes a lot of faith to see some of these things happen. But if you hold on, uh, God will, will provide the way but, uh, you know, small miracles take, you know, small faith, and big miracles take big faith. It's just true. Yeah, that, that mm. makes sense. All right. Good answer. Cheryl from Smith's Grove, Kentucky, with this question. My question is, what are you doing with yourself since you've retired? That's real. You know, I've retired from broadcasting, but I happen to be the chancellor of a, of a large university that is, rapidly growing and, and uh, has uh, about 12,000 students. And so I have my hands full of doing uh, those things. I, I have Chancellor's Forum where we deal with matters. And I've also, uh, I may, I've been writing books along the way. I've got a couple of other books since I've been, quote, retired. But I, I'm, I'm retired like after how many years, 60 years of being on television, I decided uh, that I'd had enough and I, I thought Gordon could take over and do a good job. So that, I, I stepped down from that, but I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know about this retirement stuff, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm crowding 92 in another uh, week or so. And, 
And I, I don't feel like retiring. I think the Lord's got some more for me to do. But do you have time to do some other things now that you, I know you love to work. and well, uh, I, but, I can't stand not working. Yeah. It just drives me crazy. But I, but I don't have to get up in the morning and, and, and have to say bad things about Joe Biden and what a screw up they are. And I, and I criticize all these people. Thank goodness I don't have to do that. Yeah, that's that's a relief. That's I'm what sure. I'm tired from. <laughs> All right, Dennis from Paragold, Arkansas. Go ahead with your question. I have a question for Pat. Should I go ahead and put my giving and tithes on a credit card when my budget is already overextended and it will only add to my debt? Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, you, you, you don't want to just borrow your way. I think God will supply for you, but you give out of the abundance of what he's put in your hand. And I, I, you can, I mean, if you really feel a burst of faith and, and generosity and you want to uh, borrow to do that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you're deep enough in the hole without adding to it. But ask God, I mean, every time you give, you give something out of your earnings and you say, Lord, I'm believing you that this is going to be a, a promise. It'll be a seed that'll be multiplied many fold over. Give and it'll be given unto you, pressed down, good measure, running over what men heap into your bosom. And uh, isn't that what God said? Prove me with tithes and offerings. But he didn't say borrow your way into, into blessing. I, 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 unless you have an anointing from the Lord to do that, I, I wouldn't recommend it. All right, good advice. Karen from Royal Oak, Michigan, with this question for Pat. My question is, God had every animal in front of Adam, and he was supposed to name them. How did he know what to name them? Because he had just been created himself. Well, you know, that was the nice thing about Adam. He could call him anything he wanted to. He, uh, he could look at a monkey and say, he's a monkey. Well, why do we call them monkeys? Well, somebody does. I mean, how come a giraffe is a giraffe? Well, Adam said, well, he's got a talk. I'm going to call him a giraffe. So uh, he didn't know who they were. So God says, you can call him anything you want to. So he had a clean slate. Away he went. So... Yeah. I, 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 other than that, I have no, no knowledge of it, but thanks for that question. Great question. We're starting round two with Millie from Philadelphia, another Philadelphian. Go ahead. Just wondering, are we living in the apocalypse now? If not, how do we prepare for it? Thank you. Um, the apocalypse, um, I don't know. The Bible uses the term the apocalypse are we living in it? Uh, I, I, I don't think we're we're living in any kind of a difficult time. Yeah, we 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 look. There are bad things going on in our world all the time, and Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars, but the end isn't yet. When this gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world for a witness, then the end will come. But before that comes, you will be hated of all nations. Now, that's what Jesus said. I don't know about terms like apocalypse because it's not in the, it's not in the Bible, so I, I don't use such a term. But I do know that uh, before the end comes, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world for a witness. But before that happens, you will be hated of all nations because of my name. And so Christians are being persecuted all over the world. And it is terrible to think of. And so, you know, many of these p people were told before any t tribulation comes, you're going to get raptured. And so they lost their faith, for example, in China because you know, they weren't raptured. Mm. But um, we, we, Jesus said, you'll be hated of all nations. And this gospel we preach in, the, in all the world, then the end is going to come. Up to that time, you're going to see wars, you'll see famines, you'll see earthquakes in various places. All right. Okay, I don't know about any apocalypse. I keep going. <laughs> I, think, I think the Lord's giving us more time right now. Well, He's given a little more time. But, you know, I do not believe, and I'll say this very clearly, that God is going to permit mankind to take nuclear weapons and blow this planet up. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that an asteroid might well come hurtling through skies. That, that's what the end of the age had to do. 
And I do think we, we might encounter one of those things. But I do think also the the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 is going to come to pass, but not any, quote, apocalypse. Sorry, right, what up? Okay, here's Michelle from Simi Valley, California. Go ahead. My question is, was there rain on earth before Noah built the ark and there was the great flood? Thank you. Oh, um, that's a good question. There's some people who question the fact that when, you know, people were living in the before Noah like Methuselah, who was living almost a thousand years. And I think the disease came about with a lot more moisture. We, we did have moisture uh, in the earth because there, was, there were oceans. So we had oceans before Noah. But there was something about the, the, the rainfall, the, the, the moisture that came that may well have created of the bacteria and stuff to begin to terminate human life. But I, I don't know that, and I don't think any of us do. But uh, there, there clearly was water in the earth before Noah because he, he was building an ark, but there the, were these, the fountains of the deep were uh, uh, cast over, and there was this deluge on the whole face of the earth. That was a different amount than what we we're talking about. But yes, there was obviously rain before that. Go ahead. All right, here's a caller from Delan, Florida. Go ahead. Hi, Pat. Love your show. Just wondering, why good people always get hurt? I don't understand that. Can you bring it to my attention and give me some understanding about it? I really appreciate it. The devil doesn't like good people. And, and he is an enemy of all of us. And... Uh, the thing, though, that I believe is some people bring this on themselves. And I think with we have the authority to say, I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil. I will not receive this from you. And also, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. Your confession, when you start today, are you going to say, I, I, I really think I'm going to have trouble? I really believe that there's a, a, a conspiracy against me. I really believe something bad is going to happen. Or do you say, I am a victor in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to overcome all that's there. Uh, you'll eat good by the fruit of your lips. Uh, I know this, this isn't mind over mind or anything, but that's what the Bible says. You need to speak the word. But big, the thing is, I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil against you. And then watch what begins to happen. Amen. I love that scripture. Ashley from Wilmington, Delaware has this question for Pat. I have a question regarding God is love and the Bible says that he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. If this is the case, then why in Deuteronomy 21 does God command that children who are rebellious and disobedient be stoned to death? And then in Luke 15, Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. They seem so opposite, and I don't quite understand it. Could you please explain that? You remember the prodigal son, uh, his father divided the inheritance and he went out and wasted his substance with riotous living. He was living with prostitutes. He was out drinking and partying and he, and he gave up all of his money and then he wound up in a pigsty and he was so hungry he would have eaten the cobs that the pigs were eating. Now that's one. The other, you're asking about rebellious children, and the Bible says, look, if a son is rebellious and he will not take discipline, if he curses his mother and father, if he's uh, just intent on doing evil, uh, you don't necessarily just leave him alone. You take him out and stone him to death. Now, you tell me about stopping teenage delinquency. That would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know that there's any problem that God says he, he's a loving. But look, he's a judge. And, you know, there, there has to be some punishment for sin and evil. And that doesn't mean God doesn't love people. But it means in order to maintain a normal working uh, universe, there has to be 
rewards to good people and punishment for bad people. And God knows how to do that. But he is, in the nature, he's not just love being, he's love itself. And that's the thing. You know, we'll never know love till we know God. He, we know the essence of love. He is love itself. And that's how we, we learn love. But part of love is discipline. And you're asking about discipline. Well, that's what happened in the Old Testament. That doesn't negate his loving nature at all. It just means that's what happened to teenagers who misbehaved. And uh, let me tell you, uh, you take one kid out in a, in a neighborhood and, and he, he, his parents said, oh, he won't listen to us. He curses his mother. He beats up his father and mother. Uh, he's rebellious. And uh, there's nothing we can do with him. He's not... The prodigal son repented. He was sorry and, and asked for forgiveness. The other guy didn't ask for any forgiveness at all. And, and that's in the Bible. And I tell you, you'd stop an end to delinquency, drug addiction, alcoholism, and all the rest if some of those things were put into practice today. <laughs> but I, don't put me on record as stoning teenagers. That, that would not be, that, that's not what we're going to do here in America. We're not going to do that, all right? Well, I think too many parents try to be friends. In, they try to be friends with their sons and daughters instead of parents, and yeah, it's well, such it a fine line. Parent, there has to be discipline. But the, the, the one in the Bible was the, the, the parents come with the kid, and the kid is cursing his parents, he's beating up his mother, and he won't listen to any rebuke or any discipline. That's what he, all right, next question. Michelle from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. My question for you is, my son's girlfriend, before they were married, she had an abortion, and I'm wondering if I will see that baby in heaven one day. God bless you, thank you. Uh, you know, the, I'm, the Bible isn't clear about that, but there've been people who have have seen, uh, you know, in heaven. Uh, you know, heaven is for real. The young man went to heaven, and he saw his little uh, aborted you know, sister or something. She's grown up, so we hope that the souls of these wonderful, precious ch children will live on. But uh, that doesn't. Uh, stop the fact, in my opinion, that abortion is murder. And we in America have slaughtered about 60 million precious children through abortion. And Roe versus Wade was an abomination. It gave an, a, a, a legal right to this dreadful procedure. And, uh, you know, so... You think we'll see it overturned? Yeah, I think definitely they're, they're, they're that close. They've got enough on the Supreme Court. If they have the appropriate case, they'll, uh, Roe was badly decided. It was decided on, on that Griswold versus Connecticut case that had to do with the contraceptives, right of privacy, and then they went into all that penumbras and that nonsense that, that uh, they came up with. You know, the, the, the penumbras in the 14th Amendment that gives a right of privacy, and therefore you also have a right... Uh, to uh, have an abortion. Uh, I, I think Roe versus Wade is definitely going to be overturned, but, but what happens when Roe is overturned, it merely means that it's not federalized anymore. It goes back to the states where it should have been left alone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, I, I, you don't <laughs> want me to go into all that right now. But go Good ahead. answer. <laughs> Daniel from San Diego, California has this one for Pat. Pat, I've been greatly blessed by your book, Shout It From the Housetops, but it's out of print. It has the most comprehensive description of CBN's early days. Have you considered reprinting it? Uh, well, the Shout It From the Housetops, I've, the, the other book that I've got is I Walk With a Living God, which really updates Shout It From the Housetops and, and has a more complete uh, understanding. But Shout It, uh, uh, Jamie Buckingham and I wrote that book together and... and uh, uh, it was a real tremendous book, and I'm very pleased to have been associated with it. But yes, it is out of print. And uh, But the other one, I Walk With the Living God, updates that and is much more complete. I love. I have the, cab the tabletop version or coffee table version of it. Cause it was a big book, yeah. but then you also had it in the smaller That's formats. Right. We, had, we had photographs in the, in the other so one. Nice. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but you're right. His new book will, will update you on all of that. Okay, here's Bert from Jackson, Michigan. 
I would like to know if you have any idea why Jesus would tell some of the people that he healed, he'd tell them not to tell anybody. Thank you. Well, look, Jesus was destined to die on the cross, and he didn't want people to follow him because he would feed them bread or because he'd heal their diseases, but he wanted to follow them because he was the Son of God and he was speaking the Word of God. So he knew that he would, they would attract crowds wherever he went and that for the wrong reason. They would want to make him king. You remember they tried to make him king. He didn't want to be king. He, he had to die for you and me on the cross to pay the price of the sins of the whole world. And until he did that, uh, he, he was here to reflect a perfect life, lived under the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, under the Father. But he didn't want to attract crowds to try to make him king. I think that was the main reason he, he, he wanted people just, you know, just uh, I feel you, but keep it quiet. All right. All right, here's a caller from Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Pat. We miss you. Question, what's your opinion or any scripture state? Will everyone hear the trumpet sound or just the elect? Thank you. Well, the, the apostle Paul talked about the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise. And uh, it was the Thessalonians, I believe, where you find that and uh, the trumpet will sound and, and the dead will rise. And so uh, it's, it's in there, and I think you'll find, uh, of course, in, in Revelation, they had all kinds of trumpets going off, but I, th I think uh, th that's, that's clear in, in the writings of the Apostle Paul. I think everybody's going to hear it. Yeah, you know? well, when, when, the, when the Lord comes back, but, you know, when you, you, this business about a secret slipping away, for, and then seven years later, him coming back, the Bible says the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise. Uh, you know, that's part of the Messiah. You, you know, if you, if you listen to the music of the Messiah, the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible. You know, it's in the yeah, Messiah. So, absolutely. All right, Exciting. Cool. Brenda from Redding, California, with this question for Pat. I have a question about Ananias and Sapphira. Why were they killed? The Holy Spirit pretty much killed them. But Jesus had already come, and his mercy and grace was already here. So why were they allowed to die? And if you can explain that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it looks like the early church was under, under a stricture to live a very holy life. And the idea is you allow deception. And what they were doing was they were lying. Uh, you know, as Peter said, look, when you sold this land, wasn't the money yours? Yeah. Well, you could have done with it anything you wanted to. Yes, we could have. Then why did you act like you were being generous when really you weren't? And that was the idea. You know, they held back a portion, but acted like they were somehow generous. And in the early church, God didn't want to have impurity and lies at the foundation at the beginning of the church. And, and so the Holy Spirit, he said, you didn't lie to a man, you lied to the Holy Spirit of God. And in those days, uh, there was swift retribution against that. All right. This is our final round of the special show, Your Voicemail Questions and Pat's Honest Answers. We're so blessed to have Pat with us today. We're gonna start with John on this final round. He's from Rockford, Washington. I was wondering why did God decide to split up the land on earth and give people different languages? Well, you know, the story of, of the Tower of Babel, uh, you, the nations were united against God and they were building a tower that would actually reach up to heaven to take control and that was the, the whole idea, and I think more and more when the nations of the earth come together, they come in, 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 in opposition to God. Uh, it's amazing that when the nations unite, they, they unite not for righteousness, but for the other way. 
So they were building a tower, and God came down and looked, and He said, this people have one mind and one purpose. Now, nothing they propose to do will be impossible to them. So what I'm going to do is going to make it hard for them to, to agree on things, so I'm going to give them different languages. And, and it, the, it was the, the Babel, the Tower of Babel, that, uh, where, where the languages were split. But that's why, because it, 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 you, we see it in today's world. When they come together, the nations of the earth, they're trying to get it all back together again. But when they do, it almost invariably has to do with uh, giving a platform to Satan rather than glory to God. And in today's world, the same thing, but God would not let it happen because they were doing it in rebellion against him. Huh? All right, thanks, Pat. Here's Lynn from Balcones, Texas, with this question for Pat. When God created the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and the animals, were Adam and Eve able to talk to the animals when they were in the garden with them? Well, in this story, but I won't talk to the animals. There was a man who, who uh, you, you know, would talk to the animals. You know, I, I, I'm a great horse lover. I, I train horses, and horses are terrifically sensitive to your mood. And I do believe that when you're riding a horse, at least that's what's been told to me, if you can think in pictures, I mean, I know this sounds a little way out, but I, I'm, a, I'm a skilled rider. I was riding high-level dressage. Uh, if you can think in pictures before you ask the horse to do a particular thing, he will respond to you. But it's a little hard when you're up on the big thing and you just close your eyes. And, and, and you, but if you can think in pictures. So the answer is the animals could respond to human beings because they are very sensitive and uh, Hmm. You really think that works? Huh? You really think that did that work for you? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Before, before you call for a particular movement, if you can visualize what you want him to do, it'll make it so much easier for him to do it. Wow. You know, the, Amazing. Yeah. But so they're very, very sensitive. You know, the, the slightest little thing, because they, they're herd, herd animals. But, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, well, one of our guys calls it, the, they're certain soulish creatures. and. But horses, and I think dogs are the same thing. Dog, dogs can sense your mood. Uh, and, you know, the stories of dogs who can sense when their owners are sick mm -hmm. and, and having trouble, I mean, it's just remarkable. So the, 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 they're very sensitive to our moods. And, and I think a dog particularly, you, you, you'll know exactly what your mood is. But I don't know about speaking the language to them. But we don't have any knowledge of that in the Bible at all. All right, here's George from Frankfort, Illinois. Go ahead. On the Gospel of John, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. He doesn't tell us what he wrote. What do you think Jesus wrote? Thank you. I, I, at the risk of being called a heretic, that portion of the Bible is really not in the better manuscripts. Uh, it's a nice story. It's a woman taken in adultery and... Uh, what he, he wrote, but what he said was they want to stone the woman. He said, those that are without sin, you let him cast the first stone. That's a marvelous story, but it is not in the better manuscripts that have been translated into the Bible. Wow. So Amazing. So do I know what he wrote? I, I, I have no idea. But the, oh, there, there are people who said he was writing the Ten Commandments and writing this. I don't think so. But he did say, go and sin well, no did more. Say, if you get the, he let, but that again, that whole story is not in the better manuscripts, but he said, he that is, is without sin, you, 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 you want to stone her to death, you haven't got any sin in your life, you, here's the first stone, you throw it. And they all went away because they, they're all sin, sinners. But th th that's a wonderful story, but it isn't in the better manuscripts, right? Well, here's Elise from Abbotsford, British Columbia, with this question for Pat. I would like to hear the story of how the 700 Club originally was named the 700 Club. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, that's a great story. I've told it many times. In the early days, uh, we figured our budget for the 
for operating the uh, ministry was seven hundred dollars uh, a month total to run everything. Wow. And uh, so I wanted uh, seventy people to give ten dollars a month, and so we were seven hundred. And so we called it the 700 Club because that sounded like a nightclub and it sort of had a, a nice ring to it. So that, that's, and then we started after there was an, a tremendous revival. I mean, a tremendous revival. We started a program then. But we had a telethon and we had a program called the 700 Club Program. And that has gone on. And it, has, it, it actually has paved the way for... Uh, a whole type of interactive pr programming uh, that where people could call in and have answers to their questions just like we are right now. And uh, we could pray for people and then they could get answers. And so it's, it's been a marvelous way of, 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 of putting on programming. We didn't know how to do programming. God knows better than we did. But that 700 Club has, has become the, the foundation of programming. All over the world, it's yeah. being used in every language. And here we are 60 years later. 60 years later. All right, All right Daniel from Edgewood, New, New Mexico. Go ahead. Hi, Pat. Pat, what does the Bible say about serving communion? Is it only for the members of a church, or can it be observed when small groups gather together outside the church? Thank you, and God bless. Well, I, I think where two of you gather together in my name there, I am in the midst of them. So there isn't anything uh, at all wrong with having communion where, where uh, you, you, it used to be it was the Lord's Supper, you know, and uh, ha after the, the supper was over, he took bread and wine and he said, you know, th this um, bread is my body broken for you. This wine is the new covenant uh, in my blood. So uh, I think to share it with a small group at home is perfectly uh, good and proper. Amen. I, I like to do it at home as well. Gloria from Reading, Pennsylvania. Go ahead. My question for Pat is, where did the giants come from? You know, the, the, there are a lot of people who talk about the Nephilim and all that stuff. I, I don't know that that's the case, but there was a race of people that Goliath came from uh, who were seven feet tall or so. Uh, I, I just don't know. I don't think that there are Nephilim or the children of angels, and that's, that's what a lot of people talk about. But we really don't know. But I, I, there were several people named in the Bible who were big like that, and then uh, I, there was one race of people that were quite large. But I do not believe in this business about Nephilim, and they were the children of angels. I, 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 I don't buy that part at all, but where do they come from? The Bible doesn't tell us. Well, we leave you. Well, I'm just going to say it's been marvelous to have you here today. Well, it's been fun <laughs> being with you, and I want to leave you with these words from Hebrews. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. So for Wendy and all of us, this has been our delight to be with you today. And tomorrow there's a fantastic program about healing. You don't want to miss that. But Wendy, thank you for being here. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sharing with me my fun. Bye-bye. <laughs>